The archaeology shows that when the Senna arrived at Great Zimbabwe, there were dramatic changes and innovations. And these people may have removed the old houses of the previous people and thrown the remains off the hill. Whether this was a military takeover or not, it is hard to say. Substantial huts were built, and there is some evidence that the Leopards, Kopi, Gova people still had a presence, indicating a peaceful takeover, probably due to trade. This period also brought in new pottery and a new series of glass beads, which shows a greater deal of trade. This period was a time of energy, organization, and improved craftsmanship. Some pottery similar to class 2 was still used, showing the presence of the leopard's copy people or the possibility of some woman being absorbed into the tribe. It is likely that the Sena first came to trade and gradually took over the site. The Sena people do not appear to have made figurines like the leopard's copy Gova people. Some dates given for the arrival of the Sena here were 135 AD plus or minus 80, and 185 AD plus or minus 150. Between the dates of 925 to 1000 AD, the sites of Zimbabwe, Chivona, Tati, and Havumi were thought to have been built. The Zimbabwe Sena people seem to have reached a peak in building and trade from 1300 to 1450, obviously stimulated by the trade with the Kilwa Arabs. It is likely that few stone settlements were built before the state, either in Mozambique or Zimbabwe. Out of the 80 bead types recovered from Great Zimbabwe, 62 types were related to the vendor types. But as we know that the vendor were new in southern Africa, we have to look at the people they lived with and met at Great Zimbabwe, i.e. the Lemba Center. So the Lemba are associated with Great Zimbabwe by looking at the beads. A soapstone bowl famously found near Great Zimbabwe is a vendor Lemba Seno divining bowl. A similar bowl to the Great Zimbabwe bowl was found at Mapefu's location in Vendorland. The Seno people introduced stone building here about 1250 AD and began building on their acropolis. They used the peace style of walling for their stone walls. They were to stay here for some time, and they were master builders in dacha, mud, and skilled in stonework. The huts they built seemed to have gone into a bit of a decline in quality later on, but were of a good standard. A house in the west enclosure was said to have had a snake decoration. This is more likely to have been a Semitic decoration, as this was not typical of the Bantu. Pea walling was usually f found among boulders or in sloping rocky terrain, and walls were high in relation to width. At entrances they were more likely to be squared than rounded and they did not have conical towers. It was more of a jigsaw type building. At the hill complex the western enclosure was probably the residence of the chief. This is based on the recovery of certain unusual objects and the decoration on the walls. On the hill terraces there may have been many huts and the eastern enclosure had no houses. An underground passage and six Zimbabwe stops and birds and then there was a cave. The stone walling at Great Zimbabwe is mostly pea walling at the Acropolis. The Zimbabwe birds are an emotional symbol used by politicians. They are also a misunderstood part of Zimbabwe's history. So who made them and what was their purpose? When Posol tried to remove the Zimbabwe birds in 1889, he had some resistance at first from the local Bantu chief Mugabe, but this was not for long. The reaction of the chief shows that the birds were not sacred to them, neither were they a cultural asset for them either. The fact that the Zimbabwe birds were left behind by the rune builders who left the ruins shows that they were not as important as people think. The colonial removal of the Zimbabwe birds was a big controversy in recent times. After 1980, many of the birds returned to the country, and this return was almost a symbol to Zimbabwe of their freedom from colonization and a symbol of their independence. In the Rhodesian era and in the Zimbabwe era, the Zimbabwe bird had been a primal symbol of the nation and of the ruins. In Madagascar, there were upright memorial slabs which were put up in memory of the dead. Some were stone and some were wood. 
on the wood ones they often had a climbing crocodile surmounted with a bird. Is there a connection? Well maybe as there is a Semitic and Asian influence both there and in southern Africa. The Barotsi of the upper Zambezi had many carved birds similar to the Great Zimbabwe ones. Birds fig bird figures mounted on poles are widespread among the Bantu. In 1980 three carved wooden birds and a carved wooden animal were found mounted on poles 18 feet high in a 15 yard diameter circle enclosure of the Baroka tribe at Leidenburg. At Vukwi in the Tati concession two earthenware birds were discovered in a fragment of another. They were made to be mounted and were probably once placed on the wall of the rune. In Basutland a witch doctor was found with some wooden birds on poles. A rain bird was also found at the Komi runes. A wooden bird was found in Mozambique on the roof of a hut and it had four legs to help it stay on the roof. A rosary boy on the Zambezi was found with a carved hardwood bird similar to the Great Zimbabwe birds. In all authenticated cases of birds being placed in poles, they were placed around the perimeter of the lalapa of a headman or witch doctor. This was done to protect the lalapa from the lightning bird. At Zimbabwe, the soapstone birds were placed in a similar manner around the perimeter of an enclosure which, judging by the number of phalli, soapstone bowls and other objects, probably served as the witch doctor's place. Even around Great Zimbabwe, the people in the early colonial era believed in a bird god which was a bird of prey. At Great Zimbabwe, the rain birds were placed facing towards the east which is the same direction from which the rain came. Note that this, the Lemba Sena were the witch doctors among the Venda and other tribes. The Battler, Hemacop and Flamingo have all been physical types of the spirit rain bird. As the Lemba Sena were, were at Great Zimbabwe, their customs best explain to us what the birds mean. The Lemba Sena had a sacred bird called Thatha Mamulubi, which could not be killed. This may have been the same as the sacred eagle called the Shiri Yedenga, or bird of heaven. This sacred bird they believed used to protect them from their enemies. It may have been the same bird among the Lemba and Venda which they believed brought rain and lightning. It was a creature of destruction and a bird of prey. To order of the spirit god also called Rolovimbi they used to place an image of the bird on their roofs to ward off lightning or mischief from their homes. Their spirit they believed, would then avoid the hut because he would think he was already there. So it was a rain bird or lightning bird. A similar belief in this giant spirit bird is found among the Basutu and other tribes. One of the traditions the Lemba had about the Zimbabwe birds, although it is probably a corrupted version, was that they were eagles that could be sent out by medicine men and could spy out their enemies. The eagle was also thought to be a mimic and could become like a hooded eagle or vulture, hunching his shoulders and peering evilly down his nose. So the birds at Great Zimbabwe would be these sacred birds protecting the lemba against their enemies. The crocodile and the prince represented courage. It was said that the candidates for the position of chief would swim in a crocodile infested pool to see if they had the courage for the job. The crocodile is important for vendor chiefs, which regard the crocodile as a sacred creature. Among the vendor there were carved wooden doors, and some of the doors had Arabic features. Skill carving was a sender lemba characteristic, and the lemba were the noted wood carvers among the vendor. These types of doors were not found north among the Shona. In Zimbabwe, the Hera, who have sent among them, also made similar ha hung doors, while other wooden doors with patterns were found along the Sabi. These Sena carving skills would have been applied to carving the great Zimbabwe birds. Shortly after the beginning of the second millennium, we see the beginnings of gold mining on the Zimbabwe plateau. As with ivory, it is clear that, although some was for local use, most of the gold was destined for export to the Arab world and beyond. The metalworking tools used by the Lemba Sena are the same types of tools 
found at Great Zimbabwe and other ruins and at Ngombi Eledi. The art of gold working in southern Africa was probably introduced from Arabia or India and Zimbabwe in the Lower Zambezi was probably where it started. The Lembasena were the only people still found doing this work in recent times, showing they were the descendants of these gold workers. The Basutu, Bavenda and Batonga learned some of this goldsmithing only at a later stage from the Lemba. Bracelets of copper or bronze wine spiral form have been found in Zimbabwe, type runes of different periods. These are the same designs as the Lemba and Venda ones. This type of spiral bracelet also spread to Congo Katanga, which is another mining area that had an Arab trade influence. The only other sub-Saharan bronze was in Benin, but the Benin bronzes are sometimes attributed to the Arabs. In the Transvaal, up to 3,000 tons of tin were removed and much of this would have been used to make bronze. At Great Zimbabwe, some smelted tin was found and it appears that the Senna made bronze wares purposely. At Kami and Lodlo, we also find the use of tin showing they had these skills. As this does not appear to be an African skill, it is likely that the Senna brought the skill with them when they arrived in Africa. The Senna were masters at making copper and bronze wires, and their work can be found in Great Zimbabwe and many of the runes as fine wear in the form of bracelets. Two women buried at Lodlo and several buried at Dambarari in the 17th century cemetery wore these types of bracelets. This shows how the Senna tradesmen were quite active in the Monument Tapa Empire. One girl at Dambarari had a pound of weights on each arm and 4.5 pounds on each leg. The vendor and Lemba were wearing similar bracelets in recent times that were made by the Lemba Senna. There is a possibility that the bronze made at Blaubanks in South Africa ended up in the ruins of Zimbabwe. The Zimbabwe bronze has small amounts of nickel and is similar to the tin bronze at Royberg, showing where it came from. The connection between the smelters and the ruins is pottery with chevron patterns. Copper was mixed with tin to make bronze bangles, especially in the Zimbabwe influenced areas. Tin was obtained in Zimbabwe from Rasapi and some alluvial tin may have been mined at Bikita. Kami traded tin from Royberg in South Africa as a plant, has a plant called the Transvaal Red Balloon, which is found at Royberg, Taba Zimbia, and it grows as an exotic at Kami. Tin mining at Royberg took place at the same time as the gold mining in Zimbabwe, and they used the same mining techniques, showing the same miners. Ochre was also mined using these same techniques. There was plenty of gold found at Great Zimbabwe, and even before the arrival of the Europeans, it was being looted. One of the bounty chiefs at Great Zimbabwe used to display items found in the ruins. This included a yellow metal, obviously gold object with points on it, that had been brought down from the top ruins, and a yellow stick about 3 feet 6 inches long with a knob on top, and possibly a silver bowl. The Makoba, or knob nose people, were recorded as removing items from the ruins at Great Zimbabwe. They and the Madibili found metal near the ruins which they would have carried away. Later, when the Europeans arrived, the looting continued and even the archaeologists lent a hand in this. Hall admitted that he found about 4,000 pounds of gold in the great enclosure of Great Zimbabwe. In the 19th century, renders who is often credited as being the first European to see Great Zimbabwe, was said to have unearthed a fortune in gold. Among this was a gold image, gold beads and trinkets. Before Renders was killed with a poison arrow, he buried the treasure about 11 miles from Great Zimbabwe. At Great Zimbabwe, an ingot gold was found and the evidence of gold working. Examining these and other ruins in Zimbabwe, we find the people who occupied them were skilled in metallurgy. Not only did they work in gold, but other metals such as copper and iron. The articles made by these people showed excellent design and workmanship. The finish and all the branches of the goldsmith art were practiced by them, including wire drawing and beating gold into fine sheets, plating iron and bronze with gold and burnishing. Gold wire was drawn and was made very fine, after which it was threaded into clothing. 
They also made thick wire bangles. And then we have plenty of gold beads being found in the runes, and in one of the many runes, a bead of over two ounces was found. Some of the engravings on the beads can only be seen with a magnifying glass. The gold, also beaten into small sheets, was perforated around the edges and riveted with tiny gold tacks to a wooden backing, the same way the Mapungubi rhino was made. One of the designs used was a wood image of the sun plated with gold. At least 21 of these images have been found in different Zimbabwe ruins. The most famous gold image made by the Sena people was the gold rhino of Mapungubi. Gold at Zimbabwe and Mapungubi was placed over wood and even soapstone. The same techniques of gold bead manufacture were used at Great Zimbabwe and Mapungubi. Gold beads were made using molds and gold wire. Having been drawn, was wound around a core of fiber or the hairs from the tail of an animal to form bracelets, anklets, etc. Not far from the right bank of the lower reaches of the Mitariqui River lies Renko Mine, one of Zimbabwe's richest gold mines, where its modern-day discoverers find extensive ancient workings. It is obvious from the extent of these shafts and other diggings that the gold reefs in this district supported a thriving gold mining industry several centuries ago. As this was close to Great Zimbabwe, we can assume that the area around present-day Renko was one of the sources of considerable bullion for the Great Zimbabwe culture to trade with the visitors from the east. Much of the gold would have been derived from trade in South and West Zimbabwe. The Victorian explorer Andrew Anderson in about 1888 wrote about the Lemba twice in his work 25 years in a wagon in the gold regions of Africa. One passage read, The native state that gold was worked in the forts built by men who once occupied the country, whom they called Abalamba, and there is every appearance that it is so, for I am quite of opinion that no African race of these parts ever built these strongholds or took the trouble to make such extensive excavations in the earth as we find all over the country. Thomas Baines in the gold regions of South Africa wrote about the Fort Trekkers knowing of the Sena Belemba gold mining activities. He said, I have already stated that the existence of gold in considerable quantities in South East Africa has been known from the earliest period of history. The early Dutch pioneers and times more recent brought back vague statements of its mineral wealth. In 1850 I myself visited the then little village of Potchefstroom and heard of gold among the Slamizan, Islam or Mohammedan actor beyond the Zutpansberg. This is the same area where the Lemba lived and would have been a reference to them. These accounts are further evidence showing the Sena involvement with gold and the building of the stone runes. There were also stories that before the Portuguese there were white men with long black hair who mined the gold. This record of white men would be a reference to the Lemba, Sena or Gova. The Sena were said to have been employed by Arabs to look for gold and ivory. One account was when they arrived in the Monomotapa country they were servants of the Arabs and our fathers did metal work with the Arabs with great skill. When the Arabs had returned to their country, we remained with the Roswi who loved us for our skill in metal craft. Even to a later period, they were still working with the Portuguese in the ivory and gold trade. At the end of the 19th century, Mach was given a finely made watch chain of Manica gold made by blacks in Senna. Gold mines have been found with pottery of class 3 and 4, which is pottery linked to the Senna. The Lemba Sena were also unusual amongst African tribes in their ability for mining and metallurgy. They provided neighboring tribes with metal tools and used copper obtained from deposits in their area. However, in the 18th century, the Lemba workmanship could not match the previous standards displayed by the buildings and gold ornaments found at Great Zimbabwe. In 1811, the Makwini in the far north behind the Mucha Rosi, which obviously refers to the Rosi, were mentioned. These people provided all the other tribes with metals. 
they were said to have had a mountain with iron on one side and copper the other. Natswana regarded them as a far off and very important people and received most of their metal work from them. They lived 30 to 40 days to the north and from them had spread a tale of white people. The description fits the Senna. In the Limpopo region, gold mining was still a Balemba Senna monopoly to recent times. Rama Bulana, the Bavenda chief, ordered the Balemba gold miners of the northern Transvaal to cease mining in the 1860s. When Mizilakati invaded the country known as Zimbabwe in the 1830s, he put an end to the gold mining industry. The Zulu peoples also destroyed the gold mining industry in Manika, and European control was the last nail in the coffin for Senalemba gold miners. Ironwork was predominantly the work of the Lemba among the vendor. Iron was an important export, and it was probably not until the 14th century that gold outstripped iron, and it may once have been used as a cover for their lucrative gold trade. The so-called ancient mine workings of the ancestors of the present center can be seen scattered over a large area of southern Africa. Their method of mining was to sink a vertical or inclined shaft. In the evening a wood fire was made against the face of the metal-bearing rock. In the morning water was poured on the heated rock which cracked it. With a dolerite stone, hammer and an iron gad, the ore was extracted. When they struck water the shaft sinking stopped as they had no means of dealing with the water. They mined to a maximum depth of 120 feet. The Bavenda and Basutu quarried copper and iron ore in open workings. The Senna used dolerite pestles and holes and granite to crush the gold-bearing quartz into fine powder. The gold-bearing sand was washed in a wooden dish by which the gold was then separated. <laughs>